have three speakers this afternoon, and then um, we'll have our lunch. If you need a 15 minute, sorry, sorry, our dinner, dinner, dinner. If you need um, a break in between, I'm hoping that we can continue all the way through until uh, six o'clock this afternoon. Six o'clock is fine. If you do need a break, uh, please indicate. You don't need a break. We can go right through. All right, if you do. Okay, now I'm gonna get started now. I'm just going to be talking to us on um, consciousness, language, communication, and the African-centered curriculum. He's director of cultural education for District 9 in the South Bronx. He's also the director of the Institute for Youth, which was an arm of ASCAP. He has conducted several workshops on multicultural education for businesses and industries. He also established the Train Parents for Leadership of District 9. He's a very dynamic speaker. We've heard him at the slave before. <laughs> and I'm sure you'll all agree with me that at this point in time, we do need to hear from these type of speakers. So please join me in welcoming to the podium Brother Booker T. Coleman. Let's give him a slave round. Hotep, my brothers and sisters. Before I begin mass, can I can I move around or am I structured here? Because I'm gonna have to get to that board every so often. But I will definitely try to stay here as much as possible. Oh yeah, for the board Okay. Yeah, maybe we could do that. I see when two heads work like that, it can be Once again, hotel my brothers and sisters. Okay. First of all, the first thing I would like to do is I would like to thank all who made it possible to my sister, to my sister, uh, Dr. Esther Hyatt. Yes. Believe me, a lot, of, a lot of work has gone in to be able to get me here. I, I had a, nine years ago yesterday, 812, we, we had a young daughter born to our family. And what was so interesting about this, this year was that in my family, uh, we have two daughters. And both of my daughters, my daughter turned five on March 5th. And my daughter turned nine on October 9th, so I felt as if this was a very important year for us. Because this year, both of my daughters turned the age that they happened to be born on that same day. So I, I do want to tell you, all was not lost. We had a wonderful day yesterday. Only a birthday would have kept me from you, of my daughter. So I figured that we did two great things, but I do thank my sister, Dr. Esther Hyatt, for all of the work she did to get me here. So many different things was going to happen to get me here. But no matter the ancestors watch out and I'm here, so let's move on because that's what we're about. Hotel, my brothers and sisters. Today I'd like to talk to you about consciousness, language, communication, and the African-centered curriculum. Because in moving around and discussing issues with our community, I've come to realize that what we have to do is we must demystify what it is that we're talking about. Because what is happening and what I see is that when an issue comes around, particularly an issue that we need to deal with, there is a cloud put around it. And when a cloud is put around it, then our perceptions of it take different forms. So what I'd like to do in the two hours that I have with you, with the time that we have, is I'd like to deal with some issues that might clarify what this is that we're talking about and what we can do in a realistic way to make a change. One of the things that's so very important is that there are two factors before we even go anywhere, is to understand the importance of what consciousness is. As Professor Clark has told us on several occasions, he may not have said it this way, but if I may paraphrase our elder, he has said that education, everything in life that deals with education should come around one factor, dealing with the essence of power. Whether it be self-empowerment, power over your own destiny, power over someone else's destiny that might need your help. But first of all, we must look at it as power. Not only that, but consciousness is your window on the world. It's the way in which you view the world. And so it's important that we do two things before we move forward. Although this has been said, all of our scholars have proven it, don't need to get into it, but I want to say it again. Because as the pendulum swings to the left, so too must we swing it to the right. 
So for every time they have always told us that Chemites and Egyptians were not African, I must once again tell you that by far they had to have been African people, looking like the people that are assembled in this room right now. It is so important that that be a fundamental foundation that we don't even discuss this anymore. I'm at the point now where I don't show you my documentation to prove it. Show me your documentation that proves that they're European. Don't show me documentation showing me they're not African. I'm not about that. Show me your documentation that they are what you look like. And I guarantee you there is not one shred of evidence anywhere in the world. The only thing you will find is secondary sources being used as primary sources. Now when you're in the world of research, that's very important. Because there's a difference between what Pythagoras' students said about the Pythagorean theorem and where Pythagoras said himself he got it from. It's the secondary references that are used as primary sources. Why? Because the primary sources to date have been hidden, have been destroyed, have been changed. But this information now is coming to light, so we need not even discuss it. But just to give you, I'd like to give you I like the number seven. There are many more. I'm going to give you seven reasons why Egypt or Kemet had to be African. Number one, the Kemites themselves wrote it in the papyrus of Hunefa. Let me stop here, by the way, too, because we talked about Somalia this morning. I want you to understand Somalia is ancient Puanit. It is that the land where the Kemites said that they went back to visit the gods. Right now, where we are blowing up was where Kemites sailed up happy, up happy. Puanit is the land where Hatshepsut sent an entire fleet of people to meet with her cousin, who was the ruler of Punt. Somalia today was Punt yesterday, the land of the gods. So when we're talking about what Somalia is, if I could have caught them brothers before they got on that ship and told them, instead of shooting their brothers, they would have kissed the ground. They went back to our holy land, what Dr. Richie King calls Kui land, the land of everything and all. Consciousness came about in this area. Because please, you know, we have to know that Africa as we know it today exists today only through 1885 and what was known as the Berlin Conference. Prior to that, Africa wasn't the nations that we see today. Somalia was related to, uh, well, Punt was related to Kush, as you can see with Hatshepsut, and the queen of Punt at the time. They were related, they were cousins. That whole area was related. And we have to see this. There was a relationship between the Monomotapan Empire of South Africa and other parts of Africa. So we have got to look at this as an all-inclusive an all-encompassing holistic experience. But let's go back now, because I just want to say that about Somalia. Because I want you to understand what they're doing in Mogadishu. That's the Holy Land. Okay, number one, in the Papyrus of Hunefa, the ancient Kemites themselves claim to have come from the foothills, have originated at the foothills of the Mountain of the Moon. In the central part of Africa, around Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania, there are two mountain ranges, one Kilimanjaro, and the other in Uganda, Rwenzori, R-W-E-N-Z-O-R-I. Both of them, in the native language, in the indigenous language spoken, both of these words means mountains of the moon. That's reason number one, Kemites were African. They themselves said it. Number two, in Edfu, there is a, a, a nation or a city in Edfu, E-D-F-U. There is a temple of Heru or temple of Horus that tells the story of an African by the name of Horus, which was basically a symbolic name of Horus, the resurrected one, who moved, who moved north or down happy and colonized Edfu. Now that's written in stone. That's the second reason why Kemet was in fact an Ethiopian colony. Number three, Kustal. There is a book out now by James Brunson. It's called Pre-Dynastic Egypt. I need say no more. You thought that uh, the gentleman, well, I give him all the credit in the world, who wrote the piece on lost pharaohs of Nubia, Bruce Williams. I respect it, but you need to see the book by James Brunson because he goes past Kustal. And so then you can see how in Kustal, which is south of of where Memphis was, or the first, uh, first Kemetic dynasty, 
prior to that, there was to the south of that for 9 to 12 generations. And if you want to multiply a generation by 20 or 25 years, it would be nine, between 9 and 12 times 20 or 25, rounds about near 200 years, prior to the first Kemetic dynasty, there was the entire pharaonic system in place in Kustal. Number four, quite frankly, Kemet is a gift of happy. Egypt didn't exist. you telling me European was standing in marshland, waiting for the land to get hard so they could build civilizations that they never built in Europe? There has to be a flow of consciousness. You have got to show in the evolution or the life history of the earth, you have got to fundamentally be able to show how one sequence of events would lead to another sequence of events. And as Dr. Clark shows us, what the European scholars are saying is that Europeans left Europe and came to Africa and waited in the marshlands for thousands of years, built the Kemetic civilization, returned back to Europe, came out of their dark age, returned to Africa and said they built it. That's what they're telling you happened. As I told my brother, let's get down on that conversation. Next thing I want to talk about is I want to go down the road and warn Little Red Riding Hood not to go to Grandma's house because that's a fairy tale. Because if you could even think that I would believe that story, then let's get with Little Red Riding Hood and Hansel and Gretel and let's wait for Santa Claus on December 25th. Because it's a fairy tale, but Dr. Clark informs us one of the fundamental problems that we are facing is that we're in a civilization that cannot decipher the difference between myth and reality. The majority of them. The others know what the deal is, but the others follow along with them. So Kemet didn't exist. They could not have created something on a land that did not exist. It was water. And it was the thousands upon thousands of years of happy inundating and the floodings and moving forward, that silt would remain, the waters would recede, and then a little bit of land would remain. The next year the flood season would come back, so every year over thousands of years, Kemet was created. Kemet was created from south to north. Look at a beach. When you look at the erosion of a beach, and you look at the way water will rise and then come back on shore, the, water does not as the, the, the land does not assemble itself in the water. It assembles itself along the shore. So if, in fact, Egypt was created south to north, Kemet would have had to have been created going from south to north. So it would only be natural that the people who were living on the southern part of the land, all they did was move north, move north, move north. Why would they move north, though? Look at Menes' ir irrigation. Here's reason number five. Menes himself, Narmer, writes of his ventures in Memphis. For Memphis, and this is Sheikh Ante Diop's work, for Memphis to be, have been created, Menes had to re redirect the waters of Happy and to create an L shape. And in so creating an L shape, diverting the waters of Happy, land was assembled here. I live in Co-op City, so I know what it's like to live on dumped up land, all right? I live on marshland, land, so I know what it's like. Here, in this area, he re-diverted the waters so that the waters would go around and land, he dumped up land here, and that's how Memphis was created, and he then named it Hikupata. Hikku Ptah, meaning the land of Ptah, or the spirit of Ptah. Number six. There are clearly linguistical and cultural similarities between Kemet and the rest of the uh, African continent. And then finally, number seven, there are physical artifacts. There are pictures and friezes and statues of Narmer and of Ar and, and uh, there is a, a sister in the second dynasty by the name of Preshet, one of the finest, most brilliant doctors in Kemet during the second dynasty. So there are pictures of pressure, there are pictures of a Hesse Ray. These are African folk. But now, let's put all of this together because see, I need things to bring things together for me. I can't operate just from words and language. There is a place in northern Kenya, southern Ethiopia, and it's called Namura Tunga. Namura Tunga one and Namura Tunga two. When you're looking at why civilization would have been created, when you look at Namuratunga 1 and Namuratunga 2, right around this Great Lakes region, what you begin to see is that there is what is known as astro 
Let's say it's astronomical but spiritual. Let me break down some ideas so we might look at it. When I was coming up here on the, all, all of us coming up on the bus, we passed a lot of cemeteries. In these cemeteries, you saw what are known as headstones. In Africa, they are known as steles, basically like this. If you put two of these together, I'm sure you've seen this before, right? Five laws on that side, five laws on that side. I don't need to tell you what that is, right? In Africa, they would have had about, what, 21 on each side. <laughs> they could only deal with the 10. They could only live up to 10. They could only live with 10. They didn't live up to none, but they could only live with. But in Numerotunga, what they're beginning to notice is this, and this is a tie between why there might be a relationship between burial mounds, pyramids, and astronomy. Let's look at the steles. What we see in Namurantunga, we are seeing Africans where they are saying approximately 300 BC, Africans were using these, what they call pillars or steles, as lines of sight where they could focus in and catch the serious astronomical sim uh, system. They could see the Pleiades star system. In other words, they use steles as lines of sight. I do it all the time to see if someone's messing with my room. I can sit in my room in a certain way, arrange my desk, and I'm sure you also. And you can put lines of sight on your desk. Situate yourself and look at things in front of you, and you can tell if someone's touched a desk or not by where things are in that room. Well, this is how ast astronomy started. They use these lines of sight to be able to to gear in and then look further into the heavens. What they're seeing is that in the beginnings, before they were steles, they were just mounds. But they didn't bury dead people in the beginning. The burial of, of people came after. But now, let me give you a little bit of, of, of consciousness thought. If you use steles or mounds, to study the heavens and in fact to look for God because that's what we were doing when we were searching the heavens wouldn't psychologically if we were to bury our loved ones beneath the lines of sight if these were direct routes to the heavens symbolically speaking symbolically speaking to take our uh, our deceased and place them under might also give them a line of sight to the heavens this is one of the things that we're working on in our minds to see why there is such a relationship and why there's such a debate about pyramids and burial chambers. Because the pyramids were not used as burial chambers. And we got to give that up. The pyramids were, there is absolute, and it's not even called the king's and queen's chamber. The reason why it's called a king's chamber is because it's on top. And the British, as British men do, they think men are on top. So the top chamber was called the king and the bottom chamber was called the queen. The little Pyramids outside were called the Queen's Pyramids. They are secondary lines of sight. They had nothing to do with burying people. They don't found nobody. There's, there's not one Pharaoh found in a pyramid. They're all found in the Valley of the Kings and Queens or in some other uh, burial area. So we've got to begin to look at certain things to begin to develop a psyche as to why we know there is no reason on the earth why Europeans would have built the pyramids. I want to know why. I can trace in Africa why Africans built the pyramids. But I cannot fundamentally find a reason why they would because I'm looking for pyramids in Europe. That's what I'd want to see. Don't tell me nothing about how great you are. Show me your sequence of events that would lead, even when you look at happy. Let's say this is happy. Please excuse my drawing. This is the delta that leads to the Mediterranean. As you go from south to north, you actually witness the perfection of the pyramid. At one point you have Saqqara, here you have Medum or Seneferu, and then above that you have Khufu, who is the son of Seneferu. Seneferu could never finish his pyramid, he couldn't get it quite right. It took the perfection of mathematics that, by the way, Imhotep started. That's another thing. Imhotep just didn't build the step pyramid. He built all the pyramids, structurally. He laid the blueprint for the pyramids. It just took a couple of hundred years or a hundred years to perfect the mathematics that Imhotep had laid, laid out. This is why as an African people, before we get on the field, you got to have a blueprint. 
you got to have a plan. Every major ancient city was planned in quadrants. Not only in Africa, but in America. It was planned before it was built, and it was housed after it was built. Sequence of events, chronology, so that the community knows. People knew that they were being built, they were just waiting. The plan is the key, and we've got to begin to develop that concept. So we see a reason why. So Kemet has got to be considered to be the mouthpiece for African consciousness. That there is a African connection in culture, history, and language. The second piece that is very important for us to understand is that the world's consciousness is founded on the intellectual development of African people. And the reason why part of us are schizophrenic is because part of what we experienced and we knew we created, but the other half we never heard of before. Because another perception has been laid out over it. See, when they brought Christianity back, one of the reasons why we accepted Christianity so readily was because we said, well, that's what we gave you. Of course, it kind of changed up a little bit since you brought it back to us. But last time we saw you, we were giving you this. So when they came back, it was not that difficult to embrace a faith system that had been developed on the African continent. You know how you know Christianity was created on the African continent? Because in America, the only people acting like Christians are African folk. <laughs> Even the Asians are losing their consciousness. And it's so important to understand the fundamental principles of what's happening. Because the longer a group has been in possession of a consciousness, the deeper embedded it will remain in that group of people. And the less it's been in the people, the more it will go in and out. Cosmic consciousness is intuitive free will. It is the ability to tap into the ancestral line. We have not been able to tap into an ancestral line since Europe has taken over the world. We lost our ability for cosmic consciousness when we followed their route of doing things. They are not opposite African folk. They are inversions of us. The difference is, one is the opposite and the other is turned inside out. There's a difference. They are inversions of us. When Africa's picture was taken, the negative was sent to Europe. Let's go back a couple of hundred, maybe millions of years when our ancestors walked the earth. What I'd like to work with you now is I'd like to, this is one way of looking at it. What I say that Atum is consciousness, Atum. We have a concept and we'll draw some pictures afterwards. Nun, Pata, and Atum. Atum comes out of the African concept of Atum. We're saying that Atum is consciousness, the creative word, calling into being, naming things. Consciousness. Dr. Diop teaches us that consciousness comes in two forms. Not only must you be conscious, you must be conscious that you're conscious. We in this room are conscious that we're conscious. Our brothers and sisters that did not make this trip are not conscious that they're conscious. Our job is not to make them conscious. Our job is to facilitate their becoming conscious of their consciousness. It'll take the weight off your shoulders. We are not messiahs. Pa Paulo Freire, celebrating the Schomburg's 70th birthday last year. One of the most profound things I heard that brother say, took the weight right off my shoulders. He said, our job is not to make it possible. Our job is to make it possible to make it possible. That we are part of the process. This is what the ancient Chemites were talking about when they talked about Kepler, or the process of becoming or putting your eggs or your future or everything that you is going to be you later into dung, cow dung, head heru's dung by the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't lose sight of who Hathor is, the nurturer and the sustainer, mm -hmm. queen mother of the world. Mm -hmm. Put it and would roll the eggs in the dung along happy and as they would go through the process of sun shining, the, the dung rolling, these young ones would come forward today through the dung. Now what's dung? Dung are the challenges. I don't call them problems. Europeans got problems. We have challenges. 
our perception of what we see must change. Problems are negative impacts that we must overcome. Challenges are challenges to be met. And once you meet them and you deal with them, you move on. Because remember, even Satesh had his place in Africa. Negative forces have their place in Africa. They are the balancing of the good. Okay. So Atum is consciousness, but now I'm going to bring consciousness up into intellectual development. And what I'm going to say is that consciousness is the perceptual receptor that conceptualizes intuition. That's some heavy stuff, but in Africa, so I'm going to break it down. One of the things that I admire about Malcolm, and if it, along with his process of becoming, one of the things that I most admired about Malcolm was that he was a true teacher in the sense that he was able to take extremely complex issues and make them very simple. He made you feel comfortable to be around him, as opposed to teachers who want to loud information, like I know everything and you know nothing. Yes. So our job as teachers are not so much as teachers as facilitators. So we are going to break this down into four different areas. We are going to say that consciousness has intellectual development, that intellectual development leads to consciousness. We are going to say that there are four intellectual developments. Let's call it, if I may abbreviate, please. Intellectual development comes in four stages. You have percepts, or perceptual world. Percepts are your sense perceptions. Sense perceptions in the sense of your eyes, your ears, your ability to hear, to smell, to touch, to taste. That's your first sense. Perceptual. Percepts. Sense. Now, this is what occurs. In the mind, a lot of different things occur. These sets begin, these sense perceptions begin to occur. Let's say you see a tree. This is a percept. You see a tree. You smell a tree. You can touch a tree. Now, you begin to put all of these sense perceptions together, they begin to become complex. By that I mean you begin to see fruit in the tree. You begin to see fruit fall. You begin to see leaves grow. All of these percepts begin to combine and to become complex. These percepts in their combined forms then become recepts. This is one way. This is one way of looking at the development of consciousness. Recepts are images. Your sense smells the fruit. Your eyes see the fruit. But when you close your eyes, you then can see the fruit and smell it. Because you've created an image. An image has been created from what your senses are telling you. Now, when you look at the percepts and your recepts, and you begin to combine them, something begins to occur in your ability to see and be able to do, and what then becomes, which is the cornerstone to the African curriculum, you then begin to create concepts. Concepts is what we call mother wit. The ability to be able to put things, concepts, to look at something, and be able to bring a lot of different information together. Your, recept, your concepts are made up of advanced percepts and recepts. But more directly, what you're doing is you're balancing your senses and your images, and you're beginning to develop ideas. Let me give you just an example. Let's go back to this tree. You're walking along, you see the tree, you smell the tree, all sorts of things. You could use all your sense perception, but all of a sudden, you walk into the tree, and you bang your head. Now, children do this all the time. Because, see, they're on this level. A lot of children are on, a, are on a level where they may not be able to totally express. So to them, they might think they could walk to a tree. However, all of a sudden, you bang your head, you fall back. You know and understand something has to happen. So all of a sudden, you create an image. And that image comes on many different in areas. One thing is that you feel it comes mainly through your touch, through your skin, because you banged your head on that tree. So you will remember the same is true for our young people who are not afraid of fire. Now you're not going to get me nowhere near a burner, but you're going to fight children to get away from fire. 
Let them get burned. They never come back because they have created not only a sense, they have seen the fire, they've heard the fire, they've smelled the heat and all that, but they've created an image. And that image is one of a grimace on their face. They know never. That's how we learn. So then we conceptualize and we say, don't touch fire. When you see a tree, it'd be better to walk around it. You're not going through it. So then you begin to build your concepts. But then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you begin to see that the tree is life. You begin to conceptualize and say that you can say that this tree is the tree of life. That Osiris, in all of his greatness, is buried in the tree. All of a sudden, you hook up that concept, that earthly essence, or whatever you have, with a cosmic essence. When you touch that cosmic essence, you then get into intuition. I call to it intuition somewhat like instinctive free will. Think about it. Animals have instincts. Animals know to do the right thing through instinct. When you get, when human beings get to the cosmic or the intuitional level, you do the right thing because the ancestors are guiding you to do the right thing. In Star Wars, it was called letting the force be with you. <laughs> That's where they get that Jedi Knight from and all that other stuff. from. So you have intuition, which we call, let's call instinctive free will. Please know this is not written in stone. This is to be played with, to moved around, to have our brothers such as Amos and others who are into this area begin to develop the psyche and to help the curriculum writers such as myself look at this in a more technical manner. Because this is something that I've begun to develop over the last year and a half. And that's because I needed to find a conscious reason why we needed a curriculum. Because you can say something, but unless you have the fundamental principles of what you're saying, it's not going to fly. It's not going to fly with them, and it's not going to fly with our people. And it's not going to fly with us. If we cannot make sense of what we're saying, we'll never be able to deal with it. If what you learn, you cannot use, it was never worth learning. Anything that you're in a classroom learning that you'd never use, you don't have to learn it. It's a waste of time. I'll give you one example. Look at that powerful piece right there. What's that called? No, give, no, give it to me now, what they call it. There it is, the Pythagorean theorem. Make them feel good. Play with their minds. They're living in a pastime paradise. Okay. What the ancient Chemites said was this. I say to a young brother, what you gonna do with this? They say, Mr. Cohen, what we going what how many of you have used this since you learned it? How many of you have used okay, I see two people. I see two, three, four, I would imagine scientists, mathematicians. But let me ask you this. Do you know that when you came into this room and you sat down, you had to apply this? Because you couldn't sit down. When you sat down, you created two 90 degree angles. In fact, three if you're sitting properly. The relationship between, oh, there it is. You know, I always get people to sit up straight. <laughs> always, always. A squared plus B squared equals C squared is the fundamental principle of what creates a 90 degree angle. Going back to these pyramids, what we have is what is known as mastabas. These mastabas are, in the Arabic language, means bench. In ancient Kemet and ancient Africa, all homes used to have something like this, and this is where they would entertain people. They would sit down on the bench. It was called Mastaba. Africans then began to look at this and say, but if we built them bigger, then we could bury our dead in them. Now remember what this is. This today is called a mausoleum, by the way. Mastaba, mausoleum. That's where it came from. But what Imhotep said, and even the ancient mathematicians before him said, is that if I take this masala and build another one in a particular proportion, make it smaller, <coughs> I will have an interesting structure. If I then took another masala, made it smaller, he did this about six times. Some have seven. It's coined which step pyramid you did. Step pyramid of Saka. However, there is a mathematical rule that is called the run to rise proportion. That says for what you run A, and what you run B will decide the run to rise creates the hypotenuse. Now let's 
spirituality. Anything of itself, in itself, times itself, is a spiritual essence that comes out to the holisticness of the universe. So if you take A and you square it, if you take V and you square it, you automatically, by a spiritual mathematics, now I have to be careful what I'm talking about because I want you to understand I'm not talking about the Christian spirituality. I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about how ancients could take a sacred science and balance it together and be able to touch the secrets of the universe. That was the purpose between Amenet and Amen. Amen was the hidden. Amenet was the revealed. What the consciousness said was that you will never see the hidden. By the nature of being hidden, you shall never see it. However, our Creator has made it possible to see the hidden, to feel the hidden through the revealed. So we can tap into the secrets of the universe only through what we can be actually revealed. This is what the Pythagorean theorem was dealing with, and this is why all of the Pythagoras was a priest. He was an African priest. He was a Greek, but he studied under the African priesthood. And this is what he learned. Now, let's look at this, and let's take it to this point. They say, if you go this much, run this much, rise this much, use this, then you can create a 90 degree angle and then be able to build bricks that then will make a step pyramid, the perfect pyramid. That's how you know Imhotep laid the foundations for the perfect because he could not have laid for the perfect without knowing, he couldn't have done the uh, step pyramid without knowing where he was going to go with the perfect. You see what I'm saying? Africans never did anything until they saw where they were headed. It's only now that we begin on the road and people say, where are you going? We don't know. <laughs> Africans never got on the road until they knew where they were going. Hmm. Now, let's take this further. 90 degree angles. If we sit properly, as we always tell our young people, sit properly, and that's true, you know, it's scientific. If you sit properly with your feet flat on the ground, if in fact you create a 90 degree angle between in your instep, which means that your feet have to be flat, okay? If you sit and then you have a 90 degree angle at your elbow, if you have a 90 degree angle in your lap, three 90 degree angles, <coughs> the electromagnetism of receiving information will be so powerful that you will be able to ingest and assimilate all the information. Isn't that right? If you take a hose, a water hose, and you bend it wrong, which would be equivalent to us slouching in our chairs. Bend it. What will happen to the flow of water? As you begin to straighten that hose out, what happens? That's what happened to the human family as we began to develop our consciousness. As we as, remember Homo erectus, six forms of human being. Two Australopithecine line, four Homo lines. You have Australopithecine robustus, Australopithecine gracile. They led to Homo habilis, which is the human of ability. Homo habilis led to Homo erectus, or the erect human. Erectus led to Homo sapien. Homo sapien led to Homo sapien sapien. What you have occurring in this process is the upliftment of the human being from a slouch position to a raised position that allows the electromagnetic current of consciousness to flow directly from the sun to the human being and then send out an aura. And that's what distinguishes us in the animal world, because we are animals. We must not separate ourselves into a separate entity. We are a higher form of animal that is still ascending. We're not finished. There's still other forms beside Homo sapiens sapiens. The reason why Western civilization is so glued into Homo sapiens sapiens because they know that they can never rise further than Homo sapiens. What I'm telling you is that in being caught above the 51st parallel, Africans, in their transformation into Europeans, not only lost their pigmentation, they lost their ability to become homo sapien sapien. All I ask you to do is look, forget about the fact that they can do all the things that we do. Put that aside, look at consciousness and look at Bobby Rice's work when he talks about the psychopathic personality. The Neanderthal, by nature, was not only schizophrenic, but he or she was at the same time unable to fathom the world around them in the sense that human beings do. This is why they conduct themselves the way they do. Because they, they are not Homo sapiens sapien. What brought forward Homo sapien from Homo sapiens sapien was sharing. Sharing and handshake. That meant something. When two human beings can make a handshake, 
Yes. And that handshake is binding. That creates a homo sapien sapien. When someone tells you they're going to shake your hand and we're honest, and they turn around and they break your neck, no matter how much they may be vibrating and telling you they're homo sapien sapien, they're acting on the level of a Neanderthal. One of the primary characteristics of homo sapien was xenophobia. Fear of anything that didn't look like them. They just wanted to get rid of everything. Why? Because their environment got rid of them. We're talking about African folk now. It's very important that we understand this. What we evolved into, yes, is very different from who we are. But they are still African people who have lost their way. And it's very important that when we're dealing with them on this level that we understand what it is that we're confronting. Okay, now, what I'd like to... First of all, let me stop for a moment. Because I'd like to just encourage you to please raise your hand and make comments or questions now. Because I tend to like to strike it while the iron is hot. Yes, my brother. In that book that you just mentioned about your rights. Uh, it's called the... Racial personality, I'm sorry, it's somewhere along, it's a little red pamphlet, The Racial Personality of the Psychopath, something along that, that line, and other essays, I believe. Yeah, I it's a little red pamphlet. Yeah. Uh -huh. Brother from Chicago. Yeah, third, world third, world third, world third World Press? Okay. okay thanks. Yes, my brother Lennox. Well, psychopathic personality. Psychopathic personality. Yeah, right. Maybe because of the lack of information, I, I think I see a little bit of a contribution. Could I clarify? It? Please. And the whole consciousness of Atum, and yes. where, we, where we are within that microcosmic context of Atum, which would make us quote unquote God, how can you at the same time equate us with being animal? Oh. Okay, now say that again, please. Okay. You, you mentioned that we are animals, yes. and we are by ourselves. And within the consciousness of Atum, yes. and we being the microcosmic uh, 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 expression of that microcosmic talking about, how could we one and the same at the same time? How could be God and animal? I believe plants are God. I believe cockroaches are God. Life is God. Energy is God. Energy. Let me show you something. I raise my hand. This is matter. But spirit raised my hand. Matter didn't raise it. A spirit raised it that I shall never see, I'll never know. And it's very hard to describe what it was. And the only time I can really describe it is when I lose it. When I, when I become paralyzed and I can't raise my, I can tell you how it feels not to be able to do it, but I can't tell you what, I can't really put my hand on it, it's energy. What makes an animal run is God. See, what, the, what Western civilization did is that in creating departments of everything, it put things in sequential. And at the top of the rung is not God, it's the white man. God is right underneath the white man. And you see, God answers to the white man. <laughs> Even God says he answers to a higher authority, right? It is key. Psychologically, this is what we're talking about. So in answer to your question, I do not. And when you look at Native American texts, they never separate themselves from nature. In fact, if it weren't for the plants, we wouldn't be here. So the whole living process is a cycle. And then we, giving off carbon dioxide, allow the plants to live. Because we needed to come on Earth to let the plants live. You see what I'm saying? Plants came on Earth and, was, and were able to deal at a time when carbon dioxide was pretty much all over the Earth. All of a sudden, that began to deplete, and what was needed was something that could bring forward the carbon dioxide, and what came into play was the law of polarity, or the opposite of what the plant would need, and that was the animal kingdom. And then the animal kingdom went through grades of consciousness. We were supposed to be the highest form. We're supposed to be the crown jewel. We're supposed to be the masterpiece. The only thing out of sync in the universe is us. Everything is in sync. Everything is where it should be. The only thing not in place, even the cockroaches are in place. And we're trying to kill them. It's true. Think about it. See, I mean, I talk to people about killing roaches. Don't you know that if you see a roach and the first word out of your mouth is killing, you know you're a murderer? No, really, think about it. When you want to take a life, you're a murderer. You want to take... Now, what's going to come out your mouth? Well, this is just a cockroach. This is just a cockroach. Well, that's what they said about us. This is just a... So you got to be careful who you... Because if we work by the concept that the bigger, 
you are, the more right you have to live or the stronger you are, then we move away from an entire Usyrian drama story that deals with what is might and what is right. And there is a difference. Might and right are not the same thing. Because if might were right, might would be right. Right? But might's not right. Right? When you follow the pattern of thought, it can't be. One begins with an M, one begins with an R. Okay. Did I answer your question, by the way, my brother? Yes. Because I've never separated myself in terms of the God concept. Well, what it does seem is that just because of the, the, um, the inability of the English language, it just creates that duality oh, yes, of realities. Oh, yes, man. Oh, listen, well, first of all, you, you go back to Malcolm's word in terms of the English language. English language is the language of liars. You have a word like burrow. In Africa, you couldn't have a word like that. You could have one word with three different intonations that would have three different meanings, but you would never have one word with three different spellings. Impossible. You cannot have a sound replicating and have different meanings. But you can have a sound that's replicated in different intonations, meaning different things. And the same is true with the Asian language. You can have a word like wu, and according to how you pronounce it, will be what that word means. And if you're not key into the intonation, you're going to miss it. People say, oh, that's so difficult. But what do singers do? A singer knows when they're off in tone. It's called, you know, same thing happens in language. The development of language is a very key issue in terms of consciousness because when you become conscious, self-conscious in particular, when you become conscious, you automatically develop language. And that's one of our problems. We are conscious, but we don't have a language to express that consciousness in. Because we are trying to be African and we're trying to say it in English. It can't be done. So there's our dilemma. Our dilemma is to be able to take a consciousness and to transliterate it or translate it into English. Okay, so what we have here is the different areas in terms of the intellectual development. Okay, now, what I'd like to do now is take consciousness and divide that up into certain areas. What I'd like to tell you is this. Let's look and let's say there are four types of consciousness. Again, none of this is written in stone. You might have even heard it in different language might be called different things, but the way I like to present it to you is in a way that I can understand it. And these are the four categories that I look at consciousness in terms of education and curriculum. Your first stage, let me put uh, consciousness. Let's call this the grades of consciousness. The first one is unconscious. You are unconscious. Unconscious. There's a difference, you know, between being unconscious and not being conscious. You didn't know that, right? Because I know a lot of folk that are unconscious. I know some folk that are not conscious at all. Because in your unconscious state is where your perceptual world is. For instance, someone who might be in a coma, someone who might be in a very, very deep sleep, might be on an unconscious level. Percepts, sense perceptions. You can see, you can feel in terms of uh, your perceptual world. People who might be uh, in a vegetal state could possibly, according to what level they're on. After unconscious, after you begin to develop all of these, your perceptual world joins with your receptual world and you have what is known as simple consciousness. This is the level of the animal. Animals are simply conscious. Again, what's so important is the overlapping and the making of the complex percepts and recepts. After this occurs, there begins the development of consciousness. And again, these become, as you begin to develop and you get into your conceptual world, the moment you begin to conceptualize, you then get into self-consciousness. And that is where you join your percepts, your recepts, and come to conclusions and be able to develop concepts set around. Yes, my brother. Yeah, this, this is a, a philosophical thing. Okay. How does one know that the unconscious level even exists? I, yeah, I think it's hard to say. I think that what, what I look at <laughs> is that at the level where you are not able to create the images that you need to survive, yeah. You remain on an unconscious. This is why some of our people are unconscious. We like our sneakers. We like good food. 
But we can't put all this together to do something with our life. That's unconscious to me. So there are so many different levels and grades, and this is what Africans were about. Africans never, they said the only thing that is absolute is that absolute doesn't exist. Let's keep it open. Life is open and it is, it is centered around one vital force. And that vital force is light and heat energy. Everything has a seed. And everything is impacted by that vital force and that seed grows, whether it be a tree, a human being, an animal. So in answer to your question, it is very difficult to really say. Because there are some people, I think that the president is unconscious. You understand? You see, we have a thing about psychology where in Western civilization, you literally have to be out on the street talking to yourself or doing something that is considered to be out of the ordinary or out of the norm before they think that you are mentally ill. And I am telling you that I have known people who have, well, I've known every president that I've known has been insane. <laughs> Fundamentally speaking, <coughs> whenever you cause harm to another living entity, you are insane. That's the bottom line. For no reason. Animal. In the animal world, the only time an animal will really attack, for the most part, is survival or hunger. One of the most peaceful animals is the gorilla. Yet one of the most feared. Someday I'd like to come and talk to you about the gorilla diet that I have. Yes. No, not eating gorillas. <laughs> That's the first. It is, it is what gorillas eat. For instance, if you were to take a Big Mac and throw it in a gorilla cage, the gorilla would keep the lettuce and tomatoes and throw everything else back at you while they wipe the mayonnaise off. That's, that fundamentally is what gorillas eat. They are one of the strongest animals in the world. Now, I know what we just ate for lunch. Uh, okay, now, self-consciousness. When you move from self-consciousness and your concepts become so crowded in your mind that you're beginning to bust over with all of these different abstract and concrete ideas and you're really touching what you consider to be the ancestral line where we will be in a few years. At that point of ancestral combination, you then touch something that's known as cosmic consciousness. And it is at that point that your intuition kicks in and that you can actually live and do things and repeat, like for instance, I'll give you a perfect example. Michael Jordan. Let's look at Michael Jordan, not as a basketball player, but as a scientist. That's right. That's right. Move him aside from basketball. Yes. This is what Africans say. Michael Jordan is on a cosmic level in science. To the point, a lot of people got upset with this commercial too, where they ask him, you know, how do you do all that? And he just looks at the camera and goes like this. Now, some people got upset because they wanted him to explain certain things. But at the same time, what the message I got was cosmic consciousness. Because he can do what he does and not have to explain it. Let me give you an example. There are some people who have to think about how they can get up so high. He doesn't have to think about it. Now, let me tell you what he did. Michael Jordan did not, does not defy the laws of gravity. He does not break the laws of gravity. In his magnificent melanated state, he becomes gravity. When you become the law of nature, you needn't defy or break what you are. You only have to be. You see? What they fear most about this curriculum is that our children one day will do in a classroom what Michael Jordan does on a basketball court. The reason why we are so great in sports and in acting and entertainment is because those are the only two fundamental areas where people of color have been allowed to exercise their melanin. We have never been encouraged to be smart. We have never been encouraged to be brilliant. We have never been encouraged to do the right thing. We've been encouraged to go on drugs, encouraged to leave our families, encouraged to do everything negative. But you can join my basketball team and you can make me laugh. Have you ever noticed Broadway? Broadway very, very seldom, if ever, has anything on Broadway that's not a musical or a comedy. And that is because European Americans do not have the ability, the conceptual framework, to view the world through another person's eyes. They don't have that ability to look. Let me give you an example. I remember my mother, and probably our parents too, you know, during our days of getting ourselves together, we would go to the movies and look at Cary Grant. We would look at all of the actors and actresses and our women and our men could actually implant 
what the lives of the people on the screen were. They could walk away from a Cary Grant and see themselves as being debonair. I'm just working on this issue, okay? They could see themselves as Cary Grant. They could see themselves doing the things that they watched on TV. Europeans can't do that. Europeans cannot stand to watch Wesley Snipes. They, one of the problems that they're having in basketball is that a lot of the people are saying, I don't want my sons looking to blacks as their heroes. I don't want my son to wear Michael Jordan's t-shirt. Because when I look at that t-shirt, I don't see me. So they know how powerful this is. Because when you open up an astronomy book, which I have done, any book, you'll be introduced to Copernicus. They're not going to tell you that the Mayans had the Populva <laughs> hundreds if not thousands of years before the European. They're not going to tell you that there was the Memphite text, the Pyramid text, the Coffin text, the Book of the Coming Forth the Day by Night, the Brimmerin Papyrus, and 77 other documents dealing with the comedic origins of the universe. Science stories. They're not going to tell you that. They're going to give you Copernicus. They're going to give you Lipschitz. They're going to give you Galileo. And the children's perceptual world is built on vision of Europeans. They smell Europeans. They taste Europeans. And they hear these words from a European's mouth. Their perceptual world is steeped in Europe. Let me stop here for a minute and entertain my brothers. Yeah, I mean, no, brother, please. Oh, uh, two things. Sure. One, uh, I, I also read uh, the astronomy books, and what I'm finding is that they, under these guise of multiculturalism, yes. they are including, you know, the Mayans, the Egyptians. Yes. But what they do is they put them like in a culturally isolated section yes. in the book, exactly. and that their philosophies are fundamentally closed-ended, exactly. as opposed to Europeans are open-ended. Exactly. And brother, let me just finish your point right there, because they do something visually with that. And what you'll notice when they do that is that they'll box it. And when they box it, psychologically, they put it into the area that you're saying. I'm talking about a curriculum book. When I go into a book and I'm looking at curriculum in the development of children's minds, what was just said is fundamentally what happens. When you have something on like brave people and they have a piece on Frederick Douglass, they'll have a picture of them and they'll have a caption. But they will enclose it. And it will not be part of the piece on the curriculum. It's not part of the general text, and they do it for every other culture. But one other thing they do, they don't get into the consciousness of it. They will present it, but they will not show you the train of thought that went into it. Because if they do, it'll knock Copernicus off. They can. If they show you where Copernicus, Copernicus got his information, I mean, if they tell you where Freud got his information, John got his information, if they told you that Volta, you know that great man Volta, got the credit for inventing the battery? Europe knew nothing about electromagnetism. Jesuit priests were about the only ones doing anything with electromagnetism. Even they couldn't deal with it. All of a sudden, Napoleon gets into Egypt, 1798, brings Volta with him. He brings Fourier with him. Fourier is the man who invented what is known as the sine wave. Okay, here's a sine wave, right here, okay? This is giving credit to a European in mathematics. He's giving credit for the sine wave, okay? Volta, that's where the word volt came from. He's giving credit for the battery, yet both were unheard of prior to them going to Egypt. Then Volta gets accommodation for the invention of the battery in the early 1800s. He learned that from Egypt. The reason why England went and attacked Egypt and went after the French was because England was afraid that France was going to get a monopoly on science. All of that came out of Africa. Electromagnetism. But let's look at this sine wave right here. Have you ever seen this sine wave before? None. Electromagnetic wave. But hold on. Let's take it a step further. You've seen it further even this. Look. The serpent. Apep. And what happens when you slew Apep? And what have we isolated right here? The sine wave. You see, they don't teach us this. They don't teach us this. They don't let you know that Europe was in the dark in the 1800s prior to this. Mathematically, scientifically, they knew nothing before Europe could even get together on, on a Caesarean section, named it after Caesar. Couldn't even get till they went to Uganda and watched the ancient. But they weren't doctors that did this. They were priests that were the doctors. 
You never went to Africa and went to a doctor, and the doctor, first thing doctor said to you, what was the last thing you ate? <laughs> the second thing that occurred was that the doctor, upon completion or somewhere in within the prescription, part of the prescription was healing, meditation, and music. Now, how many of us ever sat down and checked out some jazz with our doctor? <laughs> Don't you know that if you listen to jazz at the right time under the right influence, it could fix what's wrong with you? That's that melody. I'm sorry. That's what we do for my vision labor. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm exactly. Music. Music impacts melanin. When you hear that, when you're in a room, let's say you're in a hostile environment. Okay. Let's say you're in a place that that maybe you don't feel so comfortable in, and let's say someone starts playing Ola Tunji. And you hear them drums. Yes. Don't you change? Yes. Don't you feel something happen in your jet column? Immediately. Yes. Music impacts your melanin and it in, in fact it can have an impact on your body's battery. Mm -hmm. But I have to come back and talk to you about that. Yes. Yes, my mother is a nursing and the milk will not flow. Okay. This again is what I tell you. That, that's beautiful. See now these are things and it's important because what I am doing, my job as curriculum developer and staff developer, I depend on brothers such as Amos Wilson and what you're saying to me. Mathematicians, because from their books and their knowledge, I take what they do and I breathe life into it for our children. I can't tell you, Brother Amos's book, I've told him on some occasions, that book, Psychology of the Black Child, is although you don't see it flowing through curriculums I write, fundamentally, the reasons why our brother Amos says this is occurring is what we have to put into the curriculum. Because I'm going to work on something, but let me entertain my brother's second piece. Second piece. Second yes. Point, uh, also, I like playing with alternative uh, universes and ideas, you know. And one of the things I'm, uh, I like to know about the, how did your your ideas work with uh, the boundaries between, like, for instance, where do where do I end and my community begin, and where does my community begin, and where do, do where do I end? Are there boundaries within your? Yes and no. Yeah. Mm. You need some sometimes, but other times you don't. It's like the concept of being part of the whole and being the whole. It's very difficult. African people, it's very difficult to see where one begins and the other ends. And what is so... And how does that, you know, what I'm saying is that, how does that shape the psychology in the end if one cannot determine, you know, the boundaries? Because you're on a different, you're, I, I believe, from what I can understand and what I'm looking at, is that each in the, the way in which African folks set up their life, and Native Americans also, it was not about the end product. It was about the means to the end. Because there are proverbs that say, once you attain your end product, <clears throat> give it up and start the process over again. This civilization is end-oriented, future-oriented. They set a future date, and they work towards everything towards that future date. When they say African folk had no concept of future, that's not true. African folks saw the, con the future as a continuation of the present. Like when, we, when you asked your question, that was my past. Mm -hmm. However, when you asked that question, what I'm living right now was my future. I never projected my future, I just lived each present moment. In Kiswahili, it's called Sasa and Zamani. Sasa is the present and Zamani is the past. There, the concept of future in the English language is different. The reason why you have a future amongst Western civilization is because they know they don't have one. And you can only measure by which you know you're not going to get. They know they only have a certain amount of time on this earth. In another 500 years, brothers and sisters, there will be no more Europeans on earth. Let's break it down for what it is. 500 years. See, there are some folk that say, can you wait? 500 years. My brothers and sisters, may I tell you something? If we gave up half the meat we eat, we might get halfway there. At least 250 years old. Yes, well, no. But may I tell you something, my sister? The ancient Africans would tell you that you will always be here. You know, there's no such con in, in Africa. See, you you got to get off the consciousness of the Western civilization. And I'm working on it. I still got a lot of work to do. So I'm in no way anywhere near it. But what I'm beginning to realize is that the only way to move forward is to totally destroy what we know is reality. This is not consciousness for us. This is not consciousness. Why do I say that? Oh, I'll do a graph and I'll show you why. So we can understand it. But I saw a hand. Yes. Yes, my brother. Uh, yes, uh, you made a point that I tried to bring up earlier this morning, and I was trying to look at it as, as a scientific possibility, and that was that the European, through his scientists, learned 
or, or know that they don't have too long on this planet. Right. And I felt what I felt that they felt that the most uh, ideal way of more or less maintaining their life on this planet was to get inside the black woman and and by you know uh, planting his seed. Okay, yes. and look at history. At history, uh, they always all right when the conquer always conquered. All right, he had always supplanted his seed in the in the, in the conquered uh, woman, and at the same time, the seed wind up being more vicious. All right, than the father. Yes. Okay, even though all right, it was that mix that mixed blood. So with the with the with the reality of. The white man permitting us the integration and you see it all over the TV and it seemed to be encouraged, all right? I think that we have to start looking at things on a scientific level, all right? As opposed to an emotional level, okay, well, that too, but we're not looking at things scientifically. And I think that's where most of our problems is coming at. Uh, well, and that's my statement there. Sure, okay, my brother. I may respectfully to defer for the statement from a principle of genetics. It is impossible back with the original source. In actuality, by doing that, they are losing because the dominance will take over. They are losing. There's no way the European can continue himself through the black female because the black female is the original source in the genome. So there's no way they can continue that way. They actually are not conscious of the fact that they won't continue. The moment we spend talking about them or any of Eba is a moment we cannot talk about ourselves. Environment, climatology is going to take care of them. You know, I don't believe there's a greenhouse effect. I believe there's a warming trend. I don't think they have the intelligence to put holes in the ozone. I think they have the ability to pollute things. But I do not think that they have the capacity or I think we give them much too much credit. I think one of the things that happened within the breaking period of the African was that the African set up, uh, the European set up a psychological dimension that was just so terrible that it goes back to what our parents used to say, you know, you better be good because I may not be there, but God is there. That's the concept that the European put on us, is that even when I'm not there, I'm still watching you. We have an impending uh, psychology that we believe that they are actually intelligent. I'm telling you they're not. <laughs> I'm telling you that much of what they have is like a bluff in a card game. <laughs> A bluff in the card game. I'm not saying that there is not levels of dimension. I'm not saying that they do not have levels of things that they can do. But what I want to tell you is this. And I want to return back to a concept that I think is important because I think we have got to be Europeans or Africans. It's important because in terms of what our brother is saying, if in fact he plants his seed in the African woman, he is going to continue. But he gone, he is going to live out his greatest fantasy. The greatest fantasy that a European has is to be black. <laughs> That's a fantasy. That's a fantasy. My mama told me a fantasy is a dream you shall never attain, but wish to God you could. She said, never make a fantasy a goal that you can achieve, for therefore it's not a, it would never be a fantasy, it would be a great challenge. <laughs> you see, if you can achieve your fantasy, it's not a fantasy. So in terms of the European, they understand. This is why they have those breeding camps. I saw on, I didn't see, but I heard on Montel, he had, we yeah, had I people here talking like But you, you got to understand, they, they had breeding. European young ladies are breeding European children. Because we got to understand this abortion issue and all these things. See, we got to be clear. But they're not about us. If they had their way, they'd kill every one of us. It's a, they understand the only body that can bring forward a European male is a European female. And if in their dislike of their men, by the way, because they don't have too much regard for them, if in their disregard for their men, if in their attainment for higher degrees, a position in life because he's not going to support her anyway, she chooses to get rid of all of these males that are going to become the warriors for them. Oh, no, you can't have that. I'm, I'm declaring martial law taking over your body, baby. You ain't getting rid of that baby. You've got to have it. It ain't about us. It's about them. Because they understand, first of all, because of the lack of melanin in their reproductive organs, they are not re reproducing. And let me tell you something else. Don't go with that census. They don't even, listen, 
They gonna tell you how many African folk in Africa, they don't even have the count right in South Bronx. That's right. Now, if you're in your own backyard, you don't know how many black folk in the South Bronx, you definitely don't know how many in the Aturi Forest. So how are you gonna tell me who has the most people? You counted everybody in Asia and everybody in Africa? You've been throughout and inside the Aturi Forest? Don't you know the Aturi Forest is about the size of the United States? You've been through all that up in every tree? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, my brothers and sisters, what I would like to do is I would like to present to you four visuals. The first visual that I would like to show you is what I would like to call um, the uh, relationship of intellectual growth or intellectual, the stages of intellectual development and the grades of consciousness. On this side, you know this is a bar graph. Uh, not a bar graph. This is, well, it's going to become a bar graph. It's a graph, a chart. Fundamental principle of taking the linear and making it visual. One of the greatest problems that we have is that African folk are a metaphoric people. We speak metaphors. You have a young brother say, oh, that's bad. That's not bad. But in order to measure how good it is, he had to take you down the bad. In other words, it turns the cycle in such a way that it's so bad, it's good. We say, oh, that's cool. We don't mean it's cool. Life comes from heat. But we say it's cool because this is so hot, it's cold. Metaphorically, we take something to measure. You know, like I remember they used to have uh, sneakers called Uptown. And at the advertisers used to say, Uptowns are down. Because we used to say, oh, that's down. We didn't mean that was down. We meant that was, that was happening. But we used the word down to measure how bad that was. So when we said uptowns were down, right. uptown was so up, it was down. Yeah. Metaphor. We speak in metaphors. Yes, ma'am. Is that called black English? Uh, black English is a structure. Oh. Black English is a structure that can be related to every language in this diaspora. The language that African people speak in America that's called black English or ebonics can be equated to the Spanish spoken in Puerto Rico. Structurally. Structurally. We're not big in our um, articles. We don't believe we have to say I am going to the store. I be going to the store. That's right. Why do you need all them words? Right. Hey, time is essence. Think about it. No, think about it. I go to the store. The most important thing in life is time. Not money. Not love. Time. It is precious. I'm not saying love is not important, but time is the essence of life. And when we are dealing with what we're looking at, We've got to see that the Haitian who speaks that French patois, creole, whatever we would like to call it, that is structurally the same as black English. For what we did, what they do in the French language, what Puerto Ricans and people from Republica Dominicana and Cuba do with Spanish, is the same thing we did with black. It's structured. It's a good language. It's structured. Yes, Gula is another. There's a lot of things that when you look at it, we can see the relationship between we don't believe in using a lot of words, but the European has to use a lot of words to trick you. Because they're going to talk so much, my daddy would say, you're going to be so slick, you're going to pass yourself sliding. That's what they attempt to do. They try to be so slick and round, and let me tell you something else. A sophistication of a language comes out of the conceptual framework. It does not come out of how many vocabulary words you have. In fact, the amount of vocabulary words you have make it more difficult to speak the language because then you more pigeonhole the concept. Concepts are abstract. When I'm talking to somebody and, I, and someone says to me, oh, uptowns are down, I could think in a lot of different things about what those sneakers are. But if someone said to me, oh, those sneakers are just so nice, they remind me of when I was at Niagara Falls. That person, in using so many words of the happiness that they felt, is pigeonholing your consciousness to only, and if you've never been to Niagara Falls, you ain't gonna know what that person felt. <laughs> you, you, you understand what I'm saying? The language limits itself in the amount of words that it presents. The best language comes out, look at Meta Netcher. Meta Netcher was a language that could be developed by, con, by conceptual visualizations. That out of concept, let's look at it, conceptual visualization, and then we'll do this chart. Please forgive my drawing. My wife is the artist in the family. That's why she does all the illustrations. I attempt at it. She's teaching. The owl.
show you something. <laughs> she said, Netcha, this had the sound of the letter M. When you saw the owl, it brought forward the, the sound of the M. But I didn't draw this well, but I'm going to try to do something to show you where the alphabet came from. Because out of the M, and if you look at it for what the real meta Netcha is, you'll see it better. If you see it for what it is. This is M. They took a vision, and they took the structure of the vision and made it an abstract letter. When you look at the owl, go back to Meta Netcha and look at the owl, and what you're going to see is that, I, and I didn't do it well here, but what happened was is that when you do the M, it looks like this with the owl. Because the owl was here and the, and the feet were here, and this was the middle. But go back to the owl and see. But the abstract letter M came out of the visual interpretation of what the owl looked like. And that goes for every other letter. Let's look at alpha and omega. You want to look at alpha and omega? Sure. Beginning and end, right? Yeah. Okay. Alpha, right? And omega. What does that look like to you? That's where they got it from. The beginning and the end. Life. Alpha and omega. The thing is that the configuration of what we know as the alpha came straight out of an African pictographic language that then took the hieratic form, the demotic form, and all the other forms, but it began as a visual conceptualization. But now, why would the owl be chosen and be important? See, the letter M is immaterial. It's, it's not important. You could have done a number of things. Why is the owl so important? What can the owl do? What has God given the owl? See it, see, it. see it at night, but not only can it see it at night, but what can it do with its head? So it can see 360 degrees, and it can be intelligent, or it can see in dark, or it can come forward today by night. So the owl was looked upon as having the sacred ability to be able to draw light from darkness, and be able to be able to see it 360 degrees all within a circle. Mm. The dung beetle brought forward its life by taking it through dung. Mm -hmm. How many of us say, I don't want to go through that? Dung. Dung, okay, I'll use the word dung, but we use another word for it. I don't want to go through that. Which means that your character is built by going through that. See, we all looking for easy times here. Ain't no easy times. The Kemites knew even in their greatest times that life was made by the challenge. I tell folk all the time, you know, you don't get married for love. You divorce for love. Married, that's why African folk could get married and not know their bride or groom. Because they understood that marriage begins. You start loving your mate when you come home from the honeymoon. When you do what? When you come home from the honeymoon, everything is wonderful when you're in love and you're dating and you go home. But when two people must become one, when multiplicity must become unicity, when the universe has to turn itself back into itself in unity, that's when we have problems. Because that's when we say, well, baby, things aren't going well. I can leave. Well, don't you know the marriage is built on the fact that you could leave, but you didn't. That's what marriages are built on. That's why you didn't have to know the person before you married them. Because the real challenge to what you were going to do was going to happen after you were married. We think things are too easy. We got this, see, one of the things in integration is that we got this lotto fever. Not to mention we invented lotto, but that's another story. I mean, if we had held on to lotto, and if we had held on to numbers and horse racing, we'd be in control. I mean, it got so bad. They created numbers, and they, they said, hold on now. See, here's my consciousness. I grew up with numbers being illegal. I remember a lot of the runners, and I, I saw why they call them runners. <laughs> you see, that was illegal. They could be arrested. Yet, somehow or other, they made it so that they created a number system that became legal. But instead of legalizing ours, they made ours illegal. And theirs legal. Think about it. There has got to be something wrong here in terms of consciousness. And as long as we try to make sense out of this nonsense, then we 
we have relegated ourselves to schizophrenia, which all of us as black folk are anyway. I'm not just schizophrenic. Last time I counted, I had 14 different personalities. <laughs> but my strength, my strength is that I know who's in control. That's the only thing that saves me. Okay. What I'd like to do is stages, intellectual development, and I'd like to put down here grades of consciousness. What I'd like to do here is put percept, here recept, and if you would please, if you would also copy this down. Here we put concept, and here we will put intuition. Here we will put unconscious, UNC is unconscious, SIC is simple conscious, SEC is self-conscious, and COS, <coughs> CON is cosmic consciousness. Now, what I'd like to do is work this graph to show some interesting facts. When you are unconscious, where are you in terms of your intellectual development? What have you only got? Uh, as, according to the way we worked it out today. Percepts. When you have simple consciousness, where are you? Yes, okay, because you've known percept and recept, so you have recept. When you have self-consciousness, where are you? Exactly, okay. And when you are on the intuitional line, or instinctive free will, where are you? Cosmic consciousness. Cosmic consciousness. You can see, quite frankly, that there is a growth a constant growth upward that allows you to begin to develop a better sense of who you are. But now let me ask you this. Where are we on this graph? May I ask somebody to just come up and maybe identify, and I'm not trying to pull anybody, I, I just want to show you a stark reality. If I can just have someone maybe, even if you don't want to come up, if you just tell me where you think we are. Please. You mean as a people or as an individual coming up to the board? I would say as a people. As a people of African people, where are we in terms of where we find ourselves right now? Not all of us, but basically where are we? Yes, my this point, precepts. Precepts, okay. Or percepts. Percepts. Could be precepts also. All right, percepts. Okay, but okay. anybody have anything different? Okay, let me take you through an activity. African brother. African sister, for whatever reason, comes from Africa, mm. and she he's been living in the uh, United States now for maybe about two months. Let's not say what happens, but all of a sudden becomes unconscious, is in a hospital, unconscious. Next to them is a person of African-American descent <coughs> who has also met with a problem, and they are unconscious. What are the percepts of the African? Think about it. What has been the environment of this African? The senses, the percepts are senses. What have they grown up around? Nature. Nature. Family. Family. Our sense of doctors. Okay. All, what has the African American? The ancestors. Ancestors consciousness, yes. Mm -hmm. What has the African American grown up under? Doctor. Okay. So you would say that basically there is a difference between the okay. two. Mm -hmm. Now let's put aside Let's put aside any kind of ancestral common sense and things like that, because that comes into another thing. Where then are we? We're not even on this graph. <laughs> we're not on the graph, because perceptually speaking, we're not grounded in ourselves. So when even you look at consciousness, people of African descent in America are not even on this map. We are not conscious. It's not that we're unconscious, because even in our unconscious state, we would not necessarily... Now, there are those who draw upon the African influences. I'm not going to include those. I'm talking about the regular people of African-American descent who have not tapped into their ancestral line. Would not necessarily be on this graph. Yes, my brother. Yeah, the ascension to cosmic consciousness. Yes, yes. Now, is cosmic consciousness singular or plural? I say sing everything. When you get to cosmic, it's singular. Because you go from the multiplicity back to the unicity. 
you go from being an individual. But it's but it's a, but it's a how can I put it? Plural, it's a plural collectivity, not a isolated. It's not an individual. No, oh, no, yes, no, not that. But see, my brother, individual is an English word, and what I'm attempting to do is. Yes, I know, but I'm trying to transcend the consciousness. Yeah, and the transcendence of the consciousness is that God is unicity. The spirit is unicity. unicity. The universe, that's why you get the word universe. Universe. <coughs> One song. That's why I like Bob Marley so much. Last song on his last album. Redemption song. All he had was one song. Rasta is so deep into comedic knowledge. I wish we could talk about Ali Selassie, but they're very deep into spiritual knowledge. In fact, I would dare say the only African on the level are those who have tapped into those types of concepts. Not just Rasta, but those impacted by that concept. And so in not being anywhere on this, what must we do? What's, what do we have to do? You, you must go back to where we made our first error, which goes back to percepts. For our children, what I'm telling you is this. We must have them be able to smell and to taste and to see to hear and to feel Africa. We must have angst in our homes. We must be able to tap into them visually with pictures, tap into them with smells, tap into them with just perceptions, things that they can see, that then lead to the images that they will create. If they open up a planetary science book and they see Copernicus, they're gonna have a certain perception. If they open up their math book and call it Euclid's geometry, they're gonna have a certain perspective. If we begin to introduce not just historical concepts, but the actual pieces of it themselves. In other words, you just don't teach them that the ancient Kemites had the comedic origin of the universe. You teach them what the comedic origin of the universe said. You see what I'm saying? Forget Copernicus. He had it wrong then. They have it wrong now. Forget Euclid. He had it wrong then. He has it wrong now. Ancient Kemites built a building according to this, and they call it the Grand Lodge of Luxor. There's a book out, I would strongly encourage you to read it. It's called The Temple and Man. I want to warn you though, Shwala de Lubis, not one man gonna tell you that that's African folk. But if you read LeGrand Clegg's essay on the 18th dynasty, look at the work of John G. Jackson, Chancellor William, Sheikh Hamdi, you don't need, you don't need Shwala de Lubis to tell you they're African. You see, you take the knowledge of knowing they're African with what Shwala de Lubis says these people did, and you come up with what they did. And they built something known as the Grand Lodge. This Grand Lodge is not only built in the proportions of the human body using a very sacred geometric number, but that's something to talk about at a later date. They also developed this according to consciousness. For instance, let me show you what we're talking about. In this temple, in this Grand Lodge, they have the covered temple. Covered temple. They have the first, what is known as the first hypostyle hall, if I may abbreviate. They have the temple platform. Is this a yes, it is. The, the Grand Lodge. Yeah. The Africans called it Ipid at Waset. Waset was scepter. It meant the place of authority. And then Waset was the holy place. Karnak was the, was the matching temple. Yeah. But you see, the Grand Lodge was the educational yeah. facility. It was a hospital. Yeah. Karnak was the spiritual foundation. And there was a mile and a half difference between them. There was an avenue of sphinxes mm -hmm. for a mile and a half. See, you don't see it now because the Arabs have cut streets in there now. Right. And you see a few of the ram-headed uh, the ram sphinxes when you leave the temple. Right. But these ram-headed sphinxes travel for a mile and a half. Mm -hmm. If you want to say about 30 blocks mm -hmm. from one to the other. And the pro I would, I, if I could have anything, this is my fantasy. But besides having a child, this is my other fantasy. My fantasy is to be able to be in that procession is to imagine what it must have been like when these brothers, fundamental princes of color, princesses of color, who were able to tap into the color spectrum. You know what our African ancestors did with the color spectrum? I'm not surprised what George Washington Carver did. He was tapped in the end. Once he started walking out and talking to the plants, you knew the Kemites was going to tap into him. So that's why he was able to do these things with plants and agriculture. Because the Kemites had a way of doing things. You see, again, go back to the sense perceptions. The sense perception is the first perception that comes in to life system. In that event, 
then you must understand that it is color is so deeply rooted in us. Now, I know we joke about each other and the colors we wear and how loud we are, but those colors draw energies. They draw feelings. One of the reasons why our children fail so terribly is because of the colors of the walls, of the classrooms. That's one of the reasons why they fail, of, along with the fact that they have to be in a classroom. See, in Africa, we were under a tree. <laughs> It's not that we didn't have the capacity to build the buildings. Why build the building when you did not need cover? When you understood that being in the elements was the greatest thing you could have. Why hide yourself in a building? No, buildings come under the European perspective where you must hide from the cold. Making love at nighttime comes from the European. African folk don't make love at night. Too tired. You're drawn. All of your consciousness, everything that you have is gone. They do it out of shame. The whole fundamental principle of that act to the Africans, it was the most fundamental, it was a gift from God. And that it was, it was held to be sacred. And it was taught to the participants of the society in a very healthy way. However, when you then turn that concept and you're in the cold and you're ashamed of yourself and you must put on clothes and you have to hide yourself, then the act becomes something that, well, quite frankly, they say it's the original sin. <laughs> Isn't it? It's the original sin. But if it's the original sin, then God must have committed it, right? That's right. That's right. Because it couldn't have been original. Man, human, could not have created original anything. All we could have possibly done is followed the Godhead. That's right. You see, psychologically and consciously, when you break it down, you begin to fundamentally understand where a lot of our problems come from when we try to answer some questions. You can't answer in Spanish when you only speak English. We think African and we're trying to talk African and we can't do it, which leads us to the primary forces of schizophrenia. Okay. Temple platform. Then you have the peristyle hall. Uh, I'm sorry, peristyle court. Then you have the colonnade of Amun. And then you have the court of Ramses. Yes, peristyle yes, court. Yes, court. You have covered temple which is in the south. We're traveling from south to north. This is going towards Central Africa. This is going towards the Mediterranean. Okay. Covered temple is then followed by the first hypostyle hall and the temple platform, but the covered temple is comprised of these three areas here. So you not only have the covered temple, the first hypostyle hall, and the temple platform, but on the way in which they describe this, these first three pieces are hooked together within the covered temple. Which, by the way, proportionately is where the human head is. You know when you swallow something and you cough and you say it went down the wrong pipe? You know how when you chew, one pipe closes towards breathing and the other one opens so swallowing and then, and then when you choke it's because the wrong pipe? When you get into this temple and you get to the point where that, where that, where that lever is, you can't open both doors at the same time. A trachea and esophagus. A trachea and esophagus. What is the actual doorway that, that will open and close? Okay, the epiglottis. The point in this building where the epiglottis would be proportionally to the human body, you cannot open both doors at the same time. That was how they explained how you can't open up both doors. Where the pineal gland is, it was considered a secret chamber. It's locked. And only the highest of the priests who had gotten into the last grave, or the sons of light. Now, sons of light was not spelled S-O-N. spelled S-U-N. Very important. When you talk about the son of God, you're not talking about an S-O-N of God. The European made it the S-O-N of God. When the Chemites talked about it, they were talking about the S-U-N, the emanation of the sun, <coughs> being a child of the sun, emanating out of the sun. You were a child of the sun. So when they said the son of God, they did not mean a man. Mm -hmm. See that, like same thing with men, M-E-N. In Africa, when you look at the work of Sheikh Antadia, menes. Sheikh Antadia makes a relationship between the Wolof language and, and the Kemetic language, and he sees that the word M-E-N in Wolof represents, or is the word for the woman's breast. And that, in fact, this was the symbol of the word for what a matrilineal system would be. And so that when you have the word like men, when you say uh, uh, manhood, when we said manhood years ago in Africa, we did not mean males. 
we meant humanity. When the European took it over, he, he made it specifically mean the male gene. In the real derivation of the word is female. Menstruation. Say again. Menstruation. Same exact thing is all a part of men. When you look at the word M-E-N, it's a relation, it, the word goes back to women. In Africa, let me give it to you another way. In Africa, we would have been called wound man and unwound man. The male is the unwound man. That's where the word woman came from. Wound man. And man was the collective of the society and did not mean males. It meant a collective. You could say humanity, and men meant the same thing. And that the way in which we explained ourselves was not according to men and women. It was through the law of polarity. But we would have to take ourselves off the track of Western terminology. Mm -hmm. And there's no dictionary that can define these things for us right now. Yes, my brother. One of the keys in what you're saying there, uh, Brother Corman, too, is our being able to realize that duality is not an African context because in the whole consciousness of the European giving us duality, hence plurality also, we lost the essence even in the male-female <coughs> relationship. Because in reality, in the African context, we, we applaud the matriarchal or the matrilineal of society as opposed to his patriarchal situation. Also, male and female together made one man. Yes. And because he went on with his duality, he split us. But in reality, even in a cosmos, we need to get back to a unity or a singularity. Yes. That is very key. Absolutely. And you know what's also very interesting? I often tell people, I saw up here, it said male and female problems. Amongst African folk, males and females don't have problems. Our problem is a society. You took us and brought us back to our own environment, we get along quite fine. A lot of the problem is that we have European males talk about, aren't you a man? And then we as kind of silly as men, we trying to measure our manhood according to his manhood, and we forget what Malcolm told him about his manhood. Because I personally do not feel as if he is the measure of man by which I choose to measure my manhood. So therefore, when you find out about your mama, then we can deal. Because the fundamental problem, I believe, of the European male is that he has never found out who his mother was. And has never created a relationship to understand who his counterpart is. Because she was, the, the, the African woman in the Ice Age, was the first predator of the Western European man. Because remember, the woman was in control. It was the African women leaving Africa that taught the European women. That's why you got that dance around the Maypole and you got the Stonehenge and you got all this. The reason, you know, this thing about witch hunting and all this, that didn't happen in Salem. The reason why the Europeans were kicked out for religious reasons was because they were killing women. They were taking European women and burning them at the stake because they were trying to change over from the matrilineal to the patrilineal. And the only way you can do that is by attacking the leaders. And in Africa, the only oracle readers, that's why you have the palm readers who are women, the only ones that could read, the only ones who were the spiritual guide were the women. They were the oracle readers. I would not go to a man to have him read my oracle. A woman, can, a woman is the oracle reader to African people. So when African woman and man went into Europe, they brought with them their matrilineal system, taught the European woman how to handle herself. Uh, uh, down the line, she eventually became gypsy. Came down the line, developed this whole system, but now the European male attempting to overrun the, the system had to find a reason to kill her, so if she had an orgasm, she was a witch. If she said something out of line, she was a witch to be burned at the stake. These are the Europeans trying to get this industrial thing going. They say, wait a minute, y'all are crazy. You, you can't come here. They say, but this is our religion. We have freedom. They say, not here. We're going to send you someplace where you can really deal. And they sent them to America. And, um, and uh, the majority of these individuals that burnt these women ended up in Massachusetts. I mean, but this is reality. This is the history. There's a book. It's called Witches. That breaks it down real simple. And so the only way they could do it was to begin to kill off the women because the women were the ones that everybody went to to find out what was going to happen for that day. You know, like Nancy Reagan didn't do nothing without calling that lady. That's what the European did. Didn't want to do anything without. But the male was saying, but listen, they can't keep going to the European woman and I maintain power. So they began to destroy the woman. This was ancient, but then it led up to this. And there's another book, uh, Modern Britons by McRitchie, I think. You need to read that. And also, if you really want to get into the mentality of Europeans, read Irish folk tales. You know who the leprechaun is? It's the twa. That's why there was a pot of gold at the end. 
Them Europeans were chasing them little black folk around Europe mm -hmm. because they were told that they contained the alchemy. It wasn't the gold that the leprechaun would give. It was the alchemaic process of taking the base metals to rise. But it was, it was dumped into a fairy tale around a leprechaun. And the rainbow, the rainbow is in fact the circular of all life and system. So in chasing the rainbow, at the end of the rainbow, you have your reward. Well, that was the process of life and your reward at the end of life. All coming out of an African consciousness because the European, there are two things European claim they created and wouldn't know if they tripped over it. Christianity and democracy. <laughs> and all I say is, I don't go by what they say, I go by how they act. Mm -hmm. and yes, my brother. And then my brother. Yeah, oh, okay. I wanted to add something to the witch thing, because the, the, the uh, burning of the witches is included in uh, genocide, books on genocide. And, okay. I, and I, think that, uh, I think the number is seven million. Okay. And uh, yeah, over, over a period of time. Sure. Okay. And what the struggle uh, was, was that it, it dealt with the medical profession, where they were considered witches. Okay. You see, it was a struggle between male patriarchy, doctor, male yes, doctor, yes, okay. and female witches. Okay, thank you, because now I, see now when this information comes, it assimilates and allows me to see in a fuller way. Because that is true, because you have the help, because not only was she the oracle reader, but she was the herbalist. Yeah. Fundament, and I, I can exactly see how that would happen. Thank you for sharing that, man, because you just answered the question I had. Yes, my brother. I'm sorry, my brother, if I, if I, if I may entertain my brother and then my brother here. Add to what he's saying. Okay. The question of the midwives, yeah. because the doctors, again, they wanted to take total control. And they went after the midwives, and the midwives oftentimes served many roles. And so by being a midwife, that's something that a woman cannot hide, that instinct. So when her sister needed help, she couldn't hide, and they would watch and wait. And when she would sneak out to bring that baby forth, they said, that's her. Go get her. And that's how that, uh, how that happened. And it was a period of... Yeah, um, yeah. There's, a, oh, there's an African proverb that says, whatever stands, something will stand beside it. Okay, and I think it's, it's, it explains that there should be no, there's no absolute. Isn't that a duality? You look at the law of opposites. Aren't we talking about a duality? Yes. In a sense, the law, okay, let's look at the law of polarity. Please understand, you're dealing with a number line. This is mathematics here. Now, I'm, now, let's do the law of polarity, but let's vibrate on mathematics. And let's look at a number line. And let's say that you have... Okay, here's the number line. The law of polarity is on this board right here. Everything you ever need to know about what brought life into existence is right here on the board. Now, in terms of duality, there is a duality, but the duality of the same thing. For instance, let's say, let's measure bad, and let's just say bad is here because of the negative side, and let's say good is here. The unity of opposites is their point of departure. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Good and bad are equal at the zero, zero mark. Isn't that true for mathematics? Yes. Can you see the development of mathematics and numbers? But we're talking about sociology here, we're talking about morals here. You can get a math lesson with our children doing morals. And this is what Africans did. Africans vibrated around a concept, which I'm gonna do after I finish. I'm gonna vibrate around a concept to show you how to develop this idea. It's very important to understand that the point of departure for the law of opposites is here. In a sense, you have a duality, but it's the same thing. It's just where they find themselves on this particular Existence yeah. here. But my point is, there's no absolutes. Okay. I, I would it's say, everything. I would say the only thing that's absolute is that there's no such thing as absolute. Okay. No, that's what, that's what I'm saying. That's what I would say. Yeah. There are some people who would not agree with that. There are some people who, in the English language, could be able to explain an absolute. Mm -hmm. I do not, because I see one vital power that exists. Everything is made up of one vital power with the potential for the process of becoming. Within this, there occurs a force, everything has a seed, and this vital force acts on a seed. And this seed will react according to what has been given. Right. Okay? So in the sense of being absolute, what's absolute is that this exists. I mean, that's absolute, that it exists. But the absoluteness of what the European, I don't understand what absolute is, because 
Everything is relative in many different ways. Well, I think according to the, the, uh, the ancient, ancient African, our ancestors, okay. the law of opposites, okay, the duality starts there. And as it comes, as it emerges in, okay, it becomes in harmony, in oneness. Okay. okay. Hold on now. Yeah. Let me give you another thing. There are four points that you just said. Okay, we're, we're getting into another area, but I want to give you these four points. There is number one, the point of scission, the point of affinity, the point of harmony or balance, and the point of individualization. Okay, let's take what you did. This is what the this is what the Chemites were talking about, the process of becoming of the universe. This is heavy science. But let's talk. Brother said, in terms of having poles coming to be one, what the Chemites said that at one point everything was one. And that a spark, an electric magnetic spark, which is known as Patal, created a scission. And Nun split to become Patal and Atum. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to write all this down. But then at a point, affinity occurred. Affinity is the coming together of like terms. So now we have, out of nun patana tum, we have nun and nunet, ha and hahet, kak and kaket, amen, amenet. You follow me, brother? So instead of going from out these poles, we're starting with one, we're having a scission. Scission creates here, Affinity then draws together like terms or the pairs, male and female. This is the point of life. It's very important. You cannot have male and not have female. It does not exist. It could not occur. It goes against every law of nature. And people say, well, how about the seahorse? Go check out how the seahorse gets some children, then you'll understand. It's very important to be able to function and be able to see this. And the reason why I'm addressing this is because you brought this up from the poles. Then you have harmony, which is the harmony of Nun and Nunet, the harmony of Ha and Hahet, which comes to here. Then you have individualization. The individualization is that Nun stands out by itself. See, now you have something to measure it by. So Nun is individual, Nunet is individual, Ha is individual. This is what the ancient Chemites were putting down in the Memphite text. So from what I can see, a lot more research to be done. None of this is written in stone. And Dr. Ben said he's nowhere near the scratching the surface. And I'm halfway where he is. So if Dr. Ben is not near the surface, we have a lot of work to do. But my job is to make it possible to make it possible. My job is to create a spark. Because we've got to find a reason why those pyramids are too big, too complex, just to be what they say they are. Yeah, please continue your thought. If, now, you just backed up what you had said earlier when you said that in relationship, yes. we didn't have to know one another. Yes. All right? But at the same time, in the relationship, we become one. Yes. OK? Yes. And, and I mean, that, that's why I'm looking at the far as the duality of being existent, but it's not stay there. OK? It's not there. I mean, no. it, it, okay. it transcends. That's okay. what I'm saying. Okay? It's there for the process, you're saying. The process, OK? okay. But okay. the objective is to be one. Exactly. Because that's what happens every time somebody's born. Yes. We are. We are all the harmony of male and female. Please. In terms of what he was saying, I think the Kabbalists, which is a derivation from okay. what you're showing, the Kabbalists have the key. He's, he is asking three questions, basically. First of all, he's, fine, he's questioning whether there's or unity. He's also questioning whether or not there's an absolute. There must be an absolute. Because in the end, support or the uncaused cause or the that's a birth in place. That is the absolute. But in its expression from the spirit realm into the realm of matter or physics, you have two opposing forces, which is really one at two different spectrums to spark life. And then out of that, you get the very different individual expressions. But it's all back to one. Now, the beauty behind it is not are different because we are all androgynous. I'm as much female as any of these women. In and in reality, we, and in reality, we are no different from the absolute ourselves. The absolute living out an individualistic experience. I can follow that, but let me hold on for just one moment. Because we're thinking African, but speaking English. 
us are on the same track. But I think the words we're using, words, it appears as if we're talking different things. It is most definitely the polar force. The only way life can spark is when two poles harmonize. But the two poles are the same thing. But they are on two ends of the spectrum. But they're the same. And so that's very important for us to begin to realize. And also, at this point, I'd like to strongly suggest that we make Meta Neta the classical African language. Yes. The language that Puerto Ricans and Brazilians and, and Australians and Africans can speak. And the only way we can do that is return pictographic. And that's one of the, that's one of the challenges that we have. And that's one of the things that we're going to have to develop. My sister, did you have a comment or a point? Um, what I wanted to say was that we, we, were talking, we talked mm -hmm. about the beginnings of life. I was teaching them myths, and we studied Taino myths and African myths, and uh, also threw in some Greek stuff, right? Um, I was trying to explain to them how everything Americans mm -hmm. see the world, the way Africans see the world. Um, Greeks do not have a monopoly on mythology because um, they were having problems understanding how come gave birth to love and gave birth to to different things that exist in the world so what i did was i crumpled up a, a, a said okay this is you know going to be the world well before the world. and it started to expand and i opened up the paper and it was, um we got trees plants grass dirt the cockroaches People, everything became but we start from one ball, one little thing. So I mean, Native Americans and African people who are in the world don't see dualities. I don't think the world in terms of right being split up and so on. So I am water, I am fire, I am earth. The the antelope is my sister. The leaves are my brothers and sisters, and I can see from one energy, one. That energy that you speak of is called nun. There was a word that ancients used, nun, which came out of all that you're talking about, that everything came out of, was the that today in science is called um, hydrogen plasma. Or hydrogen plasma. That's what they call spirit has come to be known as something science, electromagnetism. If we were in Africa, we'd say God. Now we say electromagnetism. There's no ability for them to be able to tap into a source with themselves that can actually be because they do not believe in God. Because of the way they have structured their entire society, you cannot have a doctrine that as you treat your brother or sister, you then say you worship God and then you murder and you there's something wrong with the psychology and it comes out of the calcification of the African in those cold climates. If you look at someone who is healthy, it looks like a grape. If you looked at it as calcified, it looks like a raisin. It has been stripped of its of its of its liquidity, its life essence. Of, therefore, everything comes out in terms of what I can see, what I Anything that I hear in my head that I can't identify, we, as Africans call it the ancestral line, they call it voices. Unfortunately, they the same. And you know what happens? If you knock on someone's door long enough, you don't, you don't answer the door, you can go to someone else's door. So our ancestors are ready to Yes, my friend. There is a, uh, a expression, uh, the Mandela effect. Expressed in the Big Bang theory, and it, you know, from singularity, expansion, contraction, mm -hmm. you know, no. that separateness is probably.